Now our last speaker is Andrew Lam. He is also a multi-talented person. Uh, his memoir, Perfume Dreams, Reflections on the Vietnamese Diaspora, uh, has been around for several years and has been widely read. He's also an editor with New American Media, a regular commentator on NPR. He has a new book coming out called East Eats West, Writing in Two Hemispheres. This is due in fall of 2010, and we will be sponsoring a reading and a party for this book on Sunday, October 3rd, at the Asian American Theater Company, also run by the Vietnamese American. <laughs> um, he has a new book, he has, after that, a book uh, coming out of short stories in 2011 called Birds of Paradise. Here's the new one. It's tough to be the last because there's food across the street and you're hungry, I'm hungry, I want the wine. <laughs> so I'm going to try my best to entertain you while uh, keep you at bay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, you know, all that's listed up there will hurry. Um, I'll just mention the title and I'll read the pieces. I've never published a poem to save my life, so I picked commentaries from NPR and pieces that actually mention were poetry. <laughs> Why do you read that? <laughs> okay, last photos. When I was 11 years old, I did an unforgivable thing. I set my family photos on fire. We were living in Saigon at the time, and as Viet Cong tanks rolled toward the edge of the city, my mother, half crazed with fear, ordered me to get rid of everything incriminating. Obediently, I removed pictures from the album pages, diplomas from their glass frames, film reels from metal canisters, letters from desk drawers. I put them on a pile in the backyard and lit match. When I was done, the mementos of three generations had turned into ashes. Only years later in America did I begin to regret the act. A few pictures survived because my older brother, who was a foreign student, had taken them with him. But why didn't I save the rest when I slipped my stamp collection in my backpack hours before we boarded the C-130 cargo plane and headed for Guam? For years, I could not look at friends' family photo albums without feeling remorse. Then last week, I had a dream that was so instructive it left me with a different estimation of that loss. In the dream, I find myself once more in front of my old home in Saigon. I walk through the rusted iron gate to find, to my horror, the place gutted, an empty structure where once there was life and love. Immediately, I start to rummage among the pile of broken bricks and fallen plasters, finding at last a nightstand that once belonged to my mother. I pull out the drawer and out spill dozens of black and white photos. I am ecstatic. The photos are intact. They are exactly as I remember them. Here's one of my brother when he was 12, wearing his martial arts uniform and bowing to the camera. Here's one of my mother as a teenager, posing next to the ruins of Angkor Wat. Here is my father as a young and handsome colonel, smoking a cigar, and me and my sister holding on to our dogs, Medora and Nina, as we wave to the photographer, smiling happily. Suddenly, a little boy appears in the dream. This is my home, he yells, and you're trespassing. But these are my photos, I meekly protest. The boy looks at me with a mixture of suspicion and shrewdness and changes his tone. Well, he says, how much would you give me for these photos? But before I can find the answer, he laughs and snatches the photos out of my hand. I try to grab them back, of course, but it's too late. I walk up instead to find my arm still reaching out over the blanket in a gesture toward the pictures, still trying to retrieve them. Confused, I stare at that old empty hand for what seemed to be a long, long time. In that salty dawn with the cable cars rumbling up and down the hills and their bells clinging, clanging merrily outside my window, I saw what I hadn't seen before that nothing was ever truly lost. What I failed to retrieve in the dream survives. If 
only as an exquisite longing, but in words and language, as the poet Roka tells us, <laughs> can be made into a thing mute as the statue of an orator. The reverse is true also. Precious things lost are even transmutable. They refuse oblivion. They simply wait to be rendered into testimonies, into stories and songs. Instead of gifts, however, he had an unusual birthday wish. Everyone was asked to sing a song on the karaoke. <laughs> what began as an amusing exercise in merriment turned quickly into something I can only now describe as our first and only session of family group therapy. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to matters close to the heart, my family is notoriously inexpressive. Something within our taxi-turned culture discourages verbal intimacy. We rarely ever communicate to one another what we really feel. Immigrants and refugees from Vietnam, we often digest our losses and sorrow differently and alone. My uncle, who was going through a painful divorce, had not been able to convey to the family this profound sadness. His was still, his, he was still going in love with his wife, but she had had it with him. He masked this with jokes and once said, while well, drunk, Vietnamese men don't cry outward. Our tears flow inward, back into our heart. <laughs> but what we could not talk about, we discovered that some of us could at least sing out loud. <laughs> Thus the cousin whose wife took up with their daughter and left him high and dry sang Delilah with a heartbreaking voice. And we managed to tell him that we were sorry for his troubles by singing along with every refrain. <laughs> why, 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 Delilah, my, 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 Delilah. Another aunt, now in declining health, took the mic to sing the theme of Dr. Shafar. <laughs> Dedicated to the rest of us. God's be my love. She sang gaily in hoarse whisper. Till you are mine again. My uncle's turn and he chose a Vietnamese song title. Come what may, I will always love you. His voice was beautiful, but halfway through, he choked. <laughs> Another aunt had to sing the rest of the song while my uncle cried. <laughs> His tears were flowing outward finally and in front of everyone. <laughs> As I listened to my relatives sing, it occurred to me that words, when some are turned poetic, <laughs> somehow become acceptable in an American society where love and resentment often subterraneously. And what song did I sing at my uncle's birthday party? I sang a few, but the one I dedicated to my entire plan was Carol King's You Got a Friend. <laughs> you know the lyrics. When you're down in trouble and you need a helping care and nothing, oh, nothing is going right. Close your eyes and think of me, I know it's corny, I know. <laughs> but it was how I felt, and I just went with it. And in front of my family, I too sang my heart out. 